Our focus moves this morning from trustworthy machine learning and the security mindset to AI for social good. How do we get there? Our speaker this morning is Ahmed Abbasi, the Joe and Jane Giovannini Professor of Information Technology, Analytics and Operations in the Mendoza College of Business at the University of Notre Dame. He serves as director of the Analytics PhD program and co-director of the Human Centered Analytics Lab. Professor Abbasi completed his PhD work in information systems at the University of Arizona's Artificial Intelligence Lab. He earned an MBA and a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology from Virginia Tech. His research interests relate to text and predictive analytics. Professor Abbasi has published nearly 100 articles in journals and at conferences, including several in top-tier outlets, such as MIS Quarterly, Information Systems Research, and IEEE Intelligence Systems, among others. His work has been funded by more than a dozen grants from the National Science Foundation and industry partners such as Microsoft, eBay, Deloitte, and Oracle. Professor Abbasi serves as editor for a number of IT, machine learning, and electrical engineering journals. He is a recipient of the IEEE Technical Achievement Award, Award and Informs Design Science Award and the IBM Faculty Award. Professor Abbasi's work has been featured in various media, including the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, the Associated Press, Wired, CBS, and Fox, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage of Jordan Auditorium, Professor Ahmed Abbasi. Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. Thank you all for being here. When I saw this weather today was going to be 60 degrees, I knew we were going to have lower turnout. I would be out there as well right now if the weather were better. But thank you all for coming. And if I had to guess, I would say that we could probably put you all in three groups, right? There's the group that is here because you're interested in how, what it's going to be like to live in an AI-enabled world for the future of work, future of life, right? Does that seem reasonable for some of you? That's probably why you're here. Another group is here because you're interested in how AI is impacting research and, and the scientific discovery. But then there's the third group, my core constituency. Those of you that are here because of mandatory attendance policies, right? And thank you for your patronage. I know you have a choice of which lectures you attend, so I'm glad you're here. Some of you are going to watch the recording later and, and do your write-up. Thank you all for being here. So if I were to... Wait, wait. As society, if we were to say how AI was going to advance in the last 30, 40 years, most of us would think that it's going to advance through robots, right? Because that's what we've seen from Hollywood. And, and I'm going to talk about that setup in, in a second. But, but before I get to that, sorry, I should, I should give an outline real quick of, of my talk. There's four parts to it. The first is I want to talk about what I call the inflection point. Why do we have a 10 years hence theme on AI? right? We have AI talks. Why is Ethics Week next week going to be talking about AI? Why is AI so prominent in our strategic framework where we have a, a committee thinking about how Notre Dame is going to play a role? The consortiums that Notre Dame is joining and, and amongst other things, the, the task forces that are talking about the educational aspects and implications of AI, right? So there, there's been this inflection point. We'll talk about that. And, and then we're going to talk a little bit about AI for social good from a if we're going to say, how do we get there? We have to define a destination, the ideal state. And we also have to define a starting point, right? Which is basically, where are we now? And then, of course, once we have defined that, we can talk about our roadmap. And then finally, I've, I've been told that by the time we get to through all of that, my talk depresses people. So I wanted to end with the silver lining. But unfortunately, silver is not a Notre Dame approved color theme. So we're calling it the golden lining, right? So back to what I was just saying a second ago, though, if we were to think about what we would have thought AI would look like, the futuristic movies and so forth, this might be it, right? Humanoid robots, C-3PO and R2-D2, right? And as it turns out, that hasn't quite happened. Maybe it's happened a little bit. Raise your hand if you use robots for delivery for food. Anyone here? Just a few of you. We're in the Midwest. I didn't expect too many hands up. What if the delivery was free? 
You didn't have to pay two, three bucks for it. Raise your hand if you would have, would then consider it as well. Okay, so it's more about price elasticity than it is about adoption, right? So yes, we've had some robots, but, but still it turns out for a lot of situations, these physical robots have not really progressed the way we would have thought. In fact, one of my favorite things to do every year is go to YouTube and watch the, the highlights of epic robot fails from the DARPA challenge. So every year DARPA does this robotic competition and it's almost a little bit like those help, I've fallen and I can't get up type commercials. In fact, that actress might get replaced by, by AI, I, I think, because this is what happens. This is from 2016, but even if you were to look at the more recent ones, uh, robots not doing great with, with humanoid type situations. So as it turns out, uh, surprisingly really, the advancements with AI have come more in the digital space. How we can digitally process vision, how we can understand language, and even where, where is it going? The, the, the state of the art is what's called artificial general intelligence. These are called world models. NASA is thinking about if we're going to deploy our rover on a, on, a, on a never before seen planet, rather than using computer simulations, we can use world models to figure this out. And this is something OpenAI has been working on for a long time. In fact, here's a little video clip from 2017. And here, what's fascinating is it's just a little digital humanoid. And all the humanoid noise knows is to follow physical world rules. And the humanoid has a simple task, get to, get to that target ball. But as it's trying to get to the target ball, there are other balls gonna, that are going to hit it. And with zero data, zero anything other than just a policy of what it needs to do and, and some constraints about the world, this is all how it operates. These are called world models. And in fact, this might actually be the best thing we have even for humanoids, it's digital. And that's in important because that gets us to where we are today. If I were to ask you all, what was the inflection point, the point where we knew that AI was no longer going to be hype. No one talks about AI as hype anymore, but they used to until four, five, six years ago. For most of you, I bet that would be October or November of 2022, right? That's when ChatGPT came out, right? Does that seem fair? That's when everyone's, wow, AI is for real. And that's a fair point. It's, it's fair to say, yeah, that, that could be the inflection point for most people. And what that's done is quite remarkable. This graphic shows the number of months it took major technologies in the last 20 years to reach 100 million users. Google Translate took about six and a half years. Uber about the same. Spotify took four and a half years. TikTok, nine months. ChatGPT, two months, right? Unprecedented. And of course, if this one's a little bit hard to read, but this is shows the ability of GPT-4 on text. So you could think about this. What, what would the classroom of the future look like? If our MBA rankings are driven by test scores and GPA, we might be better off just admitting robots, right? No, that's not quite how it works, but same thing with our professors, frankly, though, right? But why stop at the students? So if we focus on ability, here we can see the LSATs, the GMATs, et cetera, the performance is quite remarkable. So we're moving towards what's called general intelligence in some ways with these tools in terms of what they can do and what they can perform. And of course, there's been a lot of articles even on campus, the ND Observer, just, I think this was last week or this week, article about what are the implications for academic integrity and so forth, right? The ability to help us with coding, to help us with writing. And this was actually a Mendoza student that anonymously wrote this article in The Observer. So JackGPT has had a profound impact. However, if you were to ask most tech experts, what was the inflection point? They would actually refer to something earlier than 2022. And I've been talking about this ad nauseum at, in my keynotes for the last five years. It's basically what I call the era AI paradigm shift. And this was something that happened in March of 2019, something completely unprecedented and something that is very relevant to business schools. 
And that is the three godfathers of deep learning won the 2018 Turing Award. So the Turing Award, how many of you have heard of the Turing Award? Raise your hand. I know I see some of my students here. Apologies. There's one of the things you learn to do is like how to take the six things you know and just rearrange them in different ways for talks. That's how that works. So it's like you take your products and this one's going to be 5312. No, kidding. But the Turing Award is essentially like the Fields Medal for math or the Nobel Prize for economics or physics and so forth, right? It is given for significant advancements in computer science. And it's been around for since I think the 1950s or 60s. It's named after Alan Turing. You might have seen the movie, if you're not familiar with Turing, The Imitation Game, where Benedict Cumberbatch he play, is played by, plays him and he helped crack the German Enigma code so the U-boats could be detected. And it was very crucial for changing the course of World War II. So that's, and that was using AI. But this award is, this was unprecedented for a couple of reasons. And by the way, so here's the three people that won it. That's Jan LeCun, Jeff Hinton, and Joshua Bengio. But it's unprecedented for a couple of reasons. First is the significant industry connections these gentlemen had at the time of their award. Now, I've taken the three of them, and I've also cheated a little bit. I've added a fourth person, Ian Goodfellow. Ian Goodfellow was Joshua Bengio's student at the University of Montreal. He's really the founder of Generative uh, Adversarial Networks, which, is, uh, which was the basis for really generative AI in many ways. Uh, and so at the time, Jan LeCun, and he's still today, chief scientist at Facebook, now Meta. Jeff Hinton was a senior scientist at Google, driving their AI strategy. Uh, Yashua Bengio, startup Element AI, is primarily backed by Microsoft. And Ian Goodfellow at the time was chief scientist at Apple. So, th so think about this. These are the folks that are driving its major scientific advancements, and they're all in significant roles at tech companies. And we know that in the last 15, 20 years, 15 years in particular, tech is driving industry, right? So I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I was very happy to go work on Wall Street in, in the late 90s. I thought, yes, I've arrived. And Wall Street was driving things for a long time. Not really as much anymore. It's tech, right? If you think about our GDP and productivity, competitive advantage as a nation, a lot of that's driven by tech. So that's very important and it's unprecedented. Prior Turing Award winners did not have such strong industry connections. There were some. There's always been a connection between research and industry, but not like this, not this deeply. The second thing, oh, by the way, and if you have any, this is just a side note there, a lot of them, most of them have Canadian affiliations as well, which is cool because Jeff Hinton was at the University of Toronto. Lacoon sounds like he has a French Canadian name. Sorry, I don't know if he is Canadian or not, but Bengio is at the University of Montreal. So is Ian Goodfellow, right? So if in the future, you always talk about how Canada has this Canadians are so nice and we don't have anything on them. If we have an existential crisis and AI ends the world, we can blame Canada for that. US one, Canada zero. But the other reason this was unprecedented, this gets into more something more academic, was the number of citations they were receiving, the volume of research. Now, for those of you that are not academic, I'm not talking about citations as in parking tickets here, right? I know that's, those, those citations are bad. In academia, we love citations because it means people are reading and re referencing our work. And this is a snapshot of their citation totals, and it's hard to see this, but we are talking about, and there's some overlap here, but well over a million citations when they won the award, or the, actually, no, this is 2021. Now that number is doubled pretty much. Again, completely unprecedented. Just to put it into perspective, the most cited person at Notre Dame all time is our, actually our provost, vice provost for graduate programs, Mike Hildreth. Mike Hildreth detects black, black matter and new galaxies. He's a physicist. He's got about 250,000 citations doing extremely important work. These gentlemen, including this guy, Ian Goodfellow, who got his PhD in 2014, has a lot more citations than that. So this is very unprecedented. And that's important because we talked about the groups that are here, the folks that are interested in their lives and their work, the practice, those that are interested in research. And AI has brought it all together. And that's why, for many of us, we felt this was the inflection point. As soon as this came out, everyone said, OK, this is going to be this is going to change everything. So the takeaways in terms of inflection point, deep learning is powering 
through language and vision, those are the two areas where we've seen significant advancements. And think about this. All of our self-driving cars, all of that is driven by vision models. They have to be able to see the road. They have to be able to read the stop signs and the traffic lights and the speed limits and see other objects and language, right? And that's what's driving the chat GPTs. Unprecedented industry involvement, unprecedented research focus, and, and all of that really March 2019. Okay, so now AI is big. We're, we're here to talk about it. Let's talk, let's define social good as a destination. And then let's also talk about where we are, right? What is point B? What is point A? And then of course we can talk about how to get there. Sound good? So defining social good, this has happened throughout the centuries, really. One could look to Aristotle and the views on common good. At Notre Dame, Alistair McIntyre, moral philosophy, he quotes Aristotle. And so we can think about this idea of the common good, a good attainable only by the community, but shared by its members. That seems intuitive. A rising tide raises all boats, right? If we work together, the collectively we, we accomplish something. In terms of bringing that to something even more salient as it relates to AI for social good, a place that a lot of people reference is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, if you were to look at our strategic framework document, it's pretty much a subset of those goals. So there's about 17 of them and it's a little bit hard to read and you don't have to worry about that, I'll, I'll go over it. But in general, it's things like alleviating poverty, alleviating hunger, equal rights for men and women, clean drinking water. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Climate, peace, things that are very common to us here at Notre Dame, things that we talk about all the time and are central to our future teaching and research mission as well. So those are really what we think about in terms of social good. And so the idea would be these are social good challenges. These are goals, and we want our research to align with those goals. And we know that research aligning with them means our, it improves our lives because AI is not just research anymore. It's everything. It's all integrated with practice, right? So that's the social good aspect of it. How do we define AI? That's one of those things that's extremely challenging. AI can mean a lot of different things. For the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna focus on machine learning, deep learning, which we just talked about, but I'm also gonna cheat and extend it to include things like data science and data mining. So I'm gonna go a little broader. That includes more statistical methods. In reality, if you looked at it as a Venn diagram, I'm, I'm, I'm taking AI and I'm adding it to data science and looking at some of that overlap here. So once we've done this, we have this, this definition one interesting thing is to look at the different phases within AI. And we, one of our papers, we analyzed all scientific research published in the last 32 years. So 1990 onwards. So this was, we're talking about billion, uh, millions and millions of, of documents and research documents. And we identified about five point something million that were related to AI. And this is a trend of what that looked like across the three different phases of AI data science. So this, as you see here, the first is this blue line, which is data management and business intelligence. And this data management and business intelligence is essentially the, how do we store and, and centralize data? How do we collect data? And then how do we build dashboards and make sense of it? And you can see that trended and it peaked around 2005 and that's in general been in decline, which is what happens with most life cycles for things, right? In, in business schools, we talk about innovation curves or Gartner hype cycles and so forth. These things have a natural sort of uh, cadence to them, right? And so we're pretty good at storing data, building dashboards, extracting descriptive statistics and metrics. The second line, this maroonish colored one, is more what's called data mining and analytics. This, is, this includes our basic machine learning methods and other tools for doing descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics, optimization, et cetera. And again, that's peaked and, and now it's stabilized, right? So it's very important there's a steady state of research happening. 
But then you see this third component, the machine learning and AI. And we see that's just growing and growing. And so it, by 2022, which is I think the last year I have on here, there's over, in total, the cumulatively, it's got over, excuse me, no, it's annually. That's, there's 5 million documents per year. So I misspoke the number. I think that's 5 million per, per year that we're, we're up to. And, and the amount of volume of documents produced for research on this, right? Now, this does include stuff that's not peer-reviewed. We went broad. We went Google Scholar Index and, and collected everything. So that's what we mean by AI for the purpose of today. But of course, the machine learning, deep learning is driving the bus in many regards. But it's also unprecedented. If I were to show you the same type of 30-year arc for most research topics, you wouldn't see this type of exponential growth. So it's just going up and up. So there's a lot happening with AI. And then there's a social good side. So this kind of begs the question. We have AI. We have social good. We then continued with a follow-up analysis. We said, how has the overlap between those evolved over time, right? We have all this focus on AI, building these foundation models. We want, we want our humanoids to be able to catch the ball but while getting hit by other balls. I always wondered how OpenAI came up with that, by the way, but anyway. And then we also have these important goals. We want to alleviate hunger and poverty. Think of it as a, like a Venn diagram, these two sets. If I were to ask you over time, surely you would think that they're coming closer together, right? Does that seem reasonable? We're, we, we're talking so much about social good. I'm wearing my for good pin today. Our business schools grow the good in business, right? So we are, surely they're coming together. And that's what we thought we would find. And this was for an editorial. So of course, with an editorial, whatever you get, whatever result you get, you're thinking, okay, if, if I get this result, here's what I'm going to say. And we thought we were going to say, it's not moving close. It's not overlapping fast enough. That's what we thought we were going to say. Have to say something. That's not what we found. We actually found that over time, they're drifting further and further apart. If you look at the proportion of research on AI and data and social good, they're moving away from each other, not coming together. And this really got us interested. Why is this happening? So let me show you, let me illustrate this. So this is showing a bunch of topics related to data science. Those are the red dots and social good. Those are blue dots. And basically it's a network. It's a network showing the amount of co-occurrence of research between red and blue dots and within red and blue dots, right? So it's not, it's showing the full network and an edge between any two circles means that the relative proportion of research between those is at least 1%. So that means if I look at data mining and health and wellness, at least 1% of the total research on data mining and health and wellness is overlapping. It involves both of those. So we're, we're, we're looking at health analytics, for example, right? That's what that edge means. Does that make sense? So co-occurrence of research over topics. And this is visualized using a spring embedding algorithm that basically means that if two things are closer together, that means there's greater overlap between those edges. By the way, if you find this cool, Professor Traeger's right there, take her class. She'll, she'll explain the theory. I think our students are doing that right now. This particular diagram is showing that overlap from 1990 to 2000. So we look at all research in the 90s and you see that overlap. And what is that there are this mixture. It's a bit of a bag of Skittles. The rainbow only has two colors, but still it's a bag of Skittles, right? The blue and red are overlapping, right? Data mining is embedded with clean water, health and wellness. And there's a huge body of literature on water, machine learning for detecting water quality. And it's all from the 90s, coincidentally. Data visualization is with sustainable communities. Machine learning is also overlapping with things like hunger a little bit, or maybe not quite hunger, but poverty and so forth. So these things are somewhat more embedded. And that's what you would think. We would think that we want to use these awesome tools to solve real world problems that we care about. The most challenging problems in society, right? 
But now I'm going to add an additional decade, the 2000s to 2010. And the professors in the room already know what's going to happen because we have you as our undergrad students and you all were born in that decade. So we know it's not going to go where we want it to go, right? I'm kidding. But we start to see, now I've added 2010. You probably noticed it. It's moving a little further apart. The blues is sticking to the blue. The red is sticking to the red. AI research is inward looking. Social good research is talk, is making connections with other social good things. So we're, we, we now understand that hunger and poverty are not mutually exclusive. There's more literature talking about those things together. Hunger, poverty, clean water, all these things are interrelated. But the machine, the red is moving apart. And finally, if I add till through 2022, it's further moving further and further away. This is proportion of research, right? So this means that the percentage of our focus in AI is less and less on social good. And sometimes it's hard to see this when you do one, one at a time. So this is what it looks like panoramically. It's a little bit small, but you can see the movement. So this was a little bit disconcerting. We were checking constantly for bugs. Did we do this right? And basically our takeaway was that We'd like to see greater emphasis on AI for social good. We would like more work on alleviating disparities, being tech ethics, peace and justice. However, the proportion, proportionately, the amount of AI and social good research is less than it has ever been. So now we've defined a destination. We want social good. We've defined our starting point. We are moving in the wrong direction. But then the next question becomes, why is that? Why are we moving in the wrong direction? And I won't spare you all the details for a talk like this, but we did a bunch of analysis. We analyzed current literature on AI for social good. What are the necessary conditions? We did a meta-analysis of papers we thought embodied social good characteristics. And I will talk about that at the end in our golden lining. I'm glad Alfonso and others are here in the audience. There are a lot of cool labs at Mendoza and Notre Dame working on this. We, I'm going to talk about three things in particular that I think are relevant for everyone and I think are really important things that we should be thinking about. And this is part of what I call the roadmap. In reality, there's more than three things, but in the interest of making this engaging, I focused on three that I thought you would find interesting. The first thing we uncovered was this important need to move from what we call the common task framework to a common good framework. So common task framework, I know Jim, Jim says we have to define our acronyms and I'm, I will talk about it, but I'm going to start using the, the, the acronym CTF. Uh, I'm notorious for using a lot of acronyms. I guess all technical researchers are, but CTF, how many of you have heard of the common task framework? A few of you, the more computational researchers, the folks with the computer science background, I can see it raised their hand. And of course, we'll talk about what the common good framework should be, but you can see where that one's going to go. It's going to be more social good focused research. So common task framework is awesome. I love the common task framework. I having a computational background, CTF has been, been huge for me. So let me talk about what it is. So common task framework or CTF is something that DARPA, our defense advanced research uh, programs agency which was frankly the basis for a lot of AI research until tech took it, took over in the last 20 years, DARPA developed this idea in the 1980s. And here's why they developed this idea specifically for natural language processing, human language technologies. In the 1950s and sixties, there was tremendous interest in the United States to automate natural language processing, right? How can we analyze documents? We're spending so much time intelligence reports, government documents, reports in general, legislation. Aver average piece of legislation is thousands of pages. A strategy is to just sneak something in there, right? That, that's a common strategy that we see on, on both sides of the aisle. And so there has always been interest in, in that processing. And it turned out in the 50s and 60s, there were some really cool advancements at IBM, University of Chicago. And, but, when those advancements were, try people tried to recreate them, it didn't work. And in science, we know we have a reproducibility and a replication crisis, right? So the re reproducibility is you do something, I apply it to my data set, and it doesn't work. 
that's not re it's not reproducing. And replication is I take your idea on your data set and I try to run it again, it's not working. So both of those things happened. And DARPA had some really embarrassing incidents. And so they said, AI literally, and I'll show you the diagram, there was almost no R&D on AI in the 70s and 80s because of that until this. The common task framework, CTF, is basically can be defined as a quantitative comparison of alternative algorithms on a fixed task. So the key thing here is that we are building benchmark data sets that are extremely general and extremely important and, and big and broad for a class of problems. And so DARPA came up with this idea in the 80s as a way to reignite AI research for human language technologies. In the 90s, IARPA and NIST jumped all over it. NIST is pretty important, right? The recent announcement about the tech consortium. NIST is leading the charge on AI governance and AI regulation standards in the US, right? And we're part of that consortium. So NIST and these others took, picked up the mantle. So the idea is to create general purpose scientific benchmark data sets. And this has been amazing, right? Because we want research that's replicable and reproducible, right? So here, this is an interesting diagram of one dimensional view of how science and AI has progressed from this perspective. So here, I'm, sh I'm showing all these different AI models. Each, mo each dot is a model. And of course, the x-axis is time, going back to the 1990s, uh, 1950s and through 2022, I think. The y-axis is really important. The y-axis here shows the number of parameters in an AI model at the time for the state of the art. State of the art meaning whatever was doing well on the common task framework benchmark data sets. So we had data sets for computer vision, how well can machine learning see things? Benchmark data sets for language. How well can it answer questions? How well can it fill in the blanks? Those are the types of data sets we're talking about. And this, just to give you some frame of reference for this y-axis, this is log scaled. So basically 10 billion, 10 billion means I think 100 billion parameters, right? And 100 billion, that's an important number. Why is 100 billion an important number? Anyone know? Any guesses? 100 billion. Yes, John, John, to say it for everyone. Number of neurons in the brain. But we're at Our Ladies University. We're top 25 in the world. Surely our students actually have more coming in. John, let's probably 120 billion. Sorry if I offended anyone by thinking you're average. No, you're above average. But wait, but then they start tailgating, John. Oh, so by the time they graduate, we're back to that. Okay, so we're back at 100 billion roughly. That's how many neurons are in the brain and that that's the analogy we use for machine learning, the weights in the brain. It's an indicator of the capacity for a model to learn. That doesn't mean it's gonna learn well. You need data, you need compute, there's many other things, but that's like the capacity to learn. And in fact, if you go, if you look here at the 1950s right here, that's the United States Navy. The first multi-layer percep perceptron in the 50s, the Navy was testing a very important idea, computer vision model. And the idea was, if someone submits a punch card, is the punch hole on the left or the right? That's, that was the task. And in 1958, this model, using maybe a thousand parameters, it took up an entire room, weighed several tons, and it was really the state of the art for AI, right? But then you notice that lull, right? You notice this big lull, in the 70s and 80s. That's after those embarrassing incidents where we didn't have the common task framework. In really common task framework phase one, you could say 80s till about 2010. This is pre-deep learning. And here, this trend, it is exponential because it's a log, log uh, y-axis. Here we see basically Moore's law. It was the big driver. The, the constraint was CPU, compute, right? And also data set sizes, right? We didn't have big data. We didn't have all these things. And then the most recent phase, why we are where we are, is common task framework phase two. Still, bench, same benchmark data sets are getting bigger. We have more image data, but deep learning. Deep learning happens. We move from Moore's law to what's called Huang's law. Jensen Huang, NVIDIA CEO, right? So GPUs are now replaced CPU. We have a Every 
place in America has a GPU shortage. It's the bottleneck constraining all research everywhere. We're, we're in task force where that's all we talk about. They want us to talk about big ideas and we're like, we need GPUs. That's what we're saying. <laughs> but the other thing that happened was the compute got better, but also the data, right? What, what else happened in 2007, eight? What are the other big things, Jeff? What happened? Yeah, 2006, 2007, what was a big change? There were a couple of big changes for data, more data being generated, why? What would happen? The one was this, right? Smartphones came out in 2007. We're feeding the beast, we're producing the data. Wikipedia got much bigger, more people are on it, and social media, et cetera. So the data sets, the datafication, consumerization, all these per perfect storm, a perfect storm for innovation happened such that those, and, and with the compute and, and cheaper compute, the number of parameters went up. And now you can see there are, we are, we have surpassed human neurons sizes over here, right there. We're, we're, we're above it now with these models. And that doesn't mean they're able to do the things we can do, of course, but still getting closer every day. So this has been phenomenal, but it's also come at a price. But I want to talk about, since we've talked about GPT, let's look at this, let's zoom in on this just for language. This, let's just look at the last 10 years. How did GPT happen, right? This is something John and I study all the time. So this is mostly language models. It's hard to see this, but those dots are orange and orange here means language. So if we zoom in, let's go to 2013, big breakthrough. A word embedding called word to vec comes out. And, and it doesn't matter for those of you not familiar with AI what it is, but the thing to know is it had 30 million learning parameters, which was unheard of at the time for natural language processing. And then you can see by 2015, it's pretty much the same new technologies, 30 million parameters. They're trained on 50 gigabytes of data, not much movement there. Right. But then 2016 to 2018, we move up to about 340 million parameters. We've now moved up to training the training it on 16 gigabytes of data. And we're up to the world of Elmo. I wrote a paper using Elmo. A lot of the language models are named after Sesame Street characters, which I've never quite understood. But then comes the most recent wave with OpenAI and others, and we are in the age of GPTs, right? So if I just were to look at through 2023, GPT-4 here, which they didn't even release it, by the way, so it's not open source anymore, which is another issue, over 1.75 trillion parameters trained on over a petabyte of data. It's just, and, and that creates all kinds of issues because who owns that data? And, and we're, we're in the age of swapping human intelligence for parameters and we can do it. We can have a lot more AI parameters than we can with humans, right? So this is really what's happened in just 10 years, quite staggering. So basically the, the downside of this is the common task framework has been great but we continue to do massive amounts of research that's just optimizing the same paradigm, building these foundation models, better job on question answering, better job filling in the blanks, and then extensions to code, right? We're extending it to code, we're extending it to revision. Now we're doing generative models to create uh, images based on prompts, but it's all that same kind of paradigm. And you would think that this is great. Now we just need a bunch of research to use these tools for good. But again, the proportion of it that's happening is not doing that. If you go look at archive and analyze the data, archive is like the open source computer science repository. Every month there's 60,000 new articles related to language models and 99% of them are not talking about downstream use cases with social good at all, right? So it's not happening. And you might be saying, wait a minute, maybe the proportion of research doesn't matter. Do we need? Maybe we just need that one article, right? That killer article that solved the hunger problem. Most scientific research tells us that's not how science advances. It's not usually, not every paper is gonna be that influential. Not every paper is gonna be the theory of relativity. It's usually incremental advancements. And so proportion does matter. Another reason proportion matters is informa from information retrieval, we know that we, 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 we run into what are called knowledge accessibility problems. If I want to go and find social good research on Google Scholar, it's like a needle in a haystack. Google's very good, it'll come up, right? But what comes up is going to be what's being cited, 
what's being read the most. And so it's like this machine that just keeps growing, right? So it creates all kinds of issues. So what we need is a common good framework. We need a collection of social good tasks comprising publicly available data sets and or access to field research with established success criteria and guardrails for avoiding unintended consequences of data science. So we basically, the, the, the CTF is good as a framework. We just need to apply it to good. This is something I've said in some of the task forces I've been on. I feel like Notre Dame could lead this. We could be constructing data sets and platforms and infrastructures. Because one of the things we'll talk about, the, the next point we'll get into, the impediment, why aren't we seeing more, is, is actually availability biases, right? Our incentive structure is publish or perish. Should I, if I'm a PhD student or a researcher and I have to, at Google, should I spend three years collecting a data set? Is that a good use of my time? And there are examples where this has happened and worked well. One of the things I'm involved with that I've gotten really into in the last year or two is, is the climate bench. So Columbia University created a school of climate where they provide benchmark data sets and we're doing all kinds of fun modeling. This is more like a hobby for me, but on water. I've gotten fascinated with water quality. How do you predict water characteristics and how you use those to forecast tropical storms. So rapidly intensifying tropical storms never used to happen in the Pacific Ocean. Last three, four years are starting to happen. And it turns out you can try to predict those. The Ohio River is filthy. Uh, you don't need AI to tell you that, but you can look at how to model and manage those things, right? Climate Bench provides a, a one stop. You can log in, and there's models, there's data sets. People can break down the barriers for, for learning and, and doing research. Here at, I, uh, at, at Notre Dame, we have uh, AI Fairness 360. Several people here work with AIF 360. I see Maria Elena's there. She's working with IBM through our uh, tech ethics lab, doing research for AI governance, AI audits. I see Cam there as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for common good frameworks and a lot of examples. The government created citizen science, Gov, to try to help improve this for the federal agencies. So there are these opportunities to do this. But again, few and far between, frankly. Second, I just alluded to this. We have to go beyond availability biases. There's this really important idea called going the last research mile. So do you know, everyone's heard of the phrase last mile? Is that, is that, have you guys heard of that? Yeah, so last mile is something we typically think of in, in, in terms of our data and telecommunications networks, right? Or delivery. We know that for any logistics supply chain, any telecommunications network, the last mile service is always the most challenging. Turns out the same is true in research. Last mile research is demonstrating contextual use case, de demonstrating application, showing humanistic outcomes. There's all these things we'll talk about here in a second, but, and, and again, there's been people talking about it and it's extremely hard to do. So I'm gonna give a couple of quick examples here. And ones where frankly, we, uh, we're, and we're, we're part of this too at Notre Dame, we do research on these things and it's really important research. But my first example, and we wrote about this in an article, is from Yelp. In, 20, in June of 2020, Yelp began adding new features that allowed business owners to identify their race and gender, right? And this is incredibly important because now it allowed us for social science researchers to study the impact of bias one might have. How does disclosing that information, once you disclose it like that, it creates a natural experiment. We have a way to identify causal effect, right? A very important idea, very important for research. And because of that, we can look at the impact that our female-owned businesses discriminated against in terms of reviews, sales, et cetera, because they're female-owned, right? Or race, right? Same thing. And this caused, between January 2021 and September 2023, 108 new studies popped up in Google Scholar <laughs> looking at this phenomena. And that's excellent, right? I think we all agree we want more research. <clears throat> But here's what's fascinating. It's a thousand percent increase in research on this specific topic. And this is fascinating. We want more research on these topics, but at the same time, it raises a question of how are we, why weren't we doing it before? How do we go past an availability bias, right? And also you have to ask yourself, would maybe Yelp might already know that this data is going to show certain things that if, if it showed anything that might be harmful or make them re reflect poorly upon them, would they have released it, right? So we're very much at the mercy 
of industry in terms of what we study and how we study it. And so why don't we do field data collections and, and have public data sets on these topics, right? Where we can vet them and make sure that they aren't biased by, by the companies. Another area, and, and again, we have researchers in our department that have done that, important research on that topic. So it's not, the issue isn't that we shouldn't be studying it. The issue is why do we only study it when someone decides in an industry that it's okay for us to study it? Same thing, I've done a lot of work with uh, mental health. Uh, and if you look at a lot of the literature, the research on detecting depression, it's using social media data, Twitter and Reddit. In fact, there are 110 seminal articles, I don't know if they're all seminal, but on that topic since 2016, that are all highly cited, highly influential. The problem is if you talk to any health, mental health or healthcare professional, they will tell you there's only a very small percentage of people suffering mental health that are tweeting about it or posting about it on Reddit. So it's incredibly important research. However, when everyone is focusing on that, it takes away from what do you do once you detect it? There's no emphasis on interventions, which are non-trivial. So maybe instead of 110, 50 of them could have focused on what to do with it once you intervene, instead of trying to improve the model by 0.1% using common task framework. And also we have a huge project here. We work with Emory for mental health where we're, it doesn't solve the fact that there's a, a shortage of psychiatrists, right? Because of the mental health uh, crisis right now. And there's less focus on clinical environments where there's a need to use AI to help physicians. Our project, we've been doing data collection for three years, interviews. Now we've just started publishing on it, right? But it's hard to do that, hard to do that data collection. So last research mile means we need programmatic research. This requires endowments, this requires funding sources that are not tied to industry interests, frankly, that are thoughtful and deliberate rather than being opportunistic. Opportunism is the challenge. That's one of the things that's the impediment. Secondly, we need to gear towards tackling bigger questions, bigger challenges. Common task framework doesn't let you do that. It's metric driven. It, it serves a very important purpose, but it's very limited in how far you can go. And often we need primary data collection. Instead of saying, what can I find readily available through an API? Field collections are a lost art. So those are the two. And then this third one, this is fascinating. LLMs as a frontier for understanding social good. So LLMs as a frontier for understanding social good means we talk all about algorithmic bias and all these issues. And there are, there's lots of issues with AI and language models. And I know we have other speakers that are gonna talk about that. Maria Malavi and others and Nick Berenti will, will be here. But it turns out there's a lot of interesting things we can do with it as well. And there's been some fascinating work that's really at the intersection with social science, computational social science. One of those ideas is what's called the geometry of culture. How do we analyze the culture of a society based on its documents? And language models provide fascinating insights into how we think about things like the poor. How do we view the poor? How did we view the poor during the Great Depression? How did we view them during the economic recession of the 70s? versus the booming periods of the 90s or 2000s. And same thing with stereotypes for gender and ethnicities. And here's a really interesting graphic. This is from Stanford. This shows two things. There's a green line and a blue line. The green line shows the average occupational difference between men and women for various jobs, right? doctors, lawyers, et cetera. And as you can imagine, there were far fewer female doctors and lawyers in the early 1900s, right? But the blue line is really interesting. The blue line is basically a language model trained on every book, newspaper article, every other digital artifact in the US from that time period. And what you notice is that the bias in the language model is very highly correlated with the, the, the occupational difference between men and women. So basically the language model is capturing how society viewed these things at the time, right? So there's been a lot of work actually now on, on gender and stuff, but the thing we're working at here that we're quite fascinated uh, with is poverty. There hasn't been as much focus on our views about the poor. And there's some really interesting subtext about the types of stereotypes we associate with, with, with people that are poor that language models can help us uncover. And in fact, taking it a step further, a really interesting article. We talk a lot about algorithmic bias. There's a whole lot of human bias as well in the world, right? Let's take a, a, a funding or a, a less 
less benign, a somewhat benign example, judges. There's been research that shows judges tend to be a little bit more harsh right before lunch, right? When you get a little cranky, you're going to give a little bit bigger sentence or less lenient. And then after lunch, they're more lenient. It's human nature. It's not, it's un, this, in this case, it's presumably unintentional, unintentional. The problem is it's really hard to study human biases because many of them, people aren't aware that they have them. And even when they are aware that they have them, it's hard to get those disclosures. So one of the really cool research areas we're seeing is people are training algorithms on the human decisions and then unpacking the algorithms to try to understand where the biases might be and how to quantify those biases. Very interesting area of research that Cornell and University of Chicago and others are leading, and we're trying to do some things here as well. So there are, so those are the three big things I focused on in terms of the roadmap, right? So now let's I want to conclude with the golden lining. Thankfully at Notre Dame, I have to plug, we have to be positive here. I want to plug some of the research that's happening. I want to start with Alfonso. I didn't even know, I thought he'd be teaching, so I could just make up what this is, but now he's there. So Alfonso leads our humanitarian operations management lab called HOPE, which is a good way to end any presentation with HOPE, right? And speaking of characteristics of common good framework and whatnot, they're focusing on improving access to drinking water in sub-Saharan Africa. Countries like Malawi and Ethiopia, and possibly maybe in the future, Tanzania and others. And we know that in these places, those water pumps, that's what's shown here on the left, are critical to the success of the villages. Many, oftentimes, a village, the villagers will have to go up to a mile to get drinking water access, right? And so those, these water pumps are crucial. And there's been advancements in the water pumps. Sensors. This is from a charity water, a nonprofit that Alfonso works with. And basically, they are able to now have data, some data, but it still requires field data collection. So the, the awesome lady you see here on the right, that's Chung Cheng Jai. She's one of our incoming professors, going to be working with hope. She's creating more hope. And she's talking, look, standing next to a water pump there in, I think that one's in Malawi or Ethiopia. I can't recall. And basically there's a lot of important problems here with data science. How do we come up with the optimal arrangement of where to place the water pumps? We have limited, limited resources to do it, but also how do we figure out how to repair them, right? It's one thing to install them, they need repair. When they break down, how do we schedule maintenance schedules and so forth? So that's an example of that research because it took several years of field data collection to figure out what are the parameters and constraints for an optimization model. The data was not all publicly available. Cheng Cheng had to go and interview people in the villages, right? Multiple trips, an example of social good research creating hope. I don't think Nick is here, but another example would be gaming analytics. We have a gamma lab, and one of the things they're focused on is positive play. So all the research shows gaming can be actually beneficial in, in certain quantities, but right now, for some people, it's really hard to do it because the culture is not inclusive, for example, for female gamers. So how do you create a more female-friendly gaming environment called Positive Play. Nick is also now managing director for the next couple of years of our industry labs. Industry labs focuses with local manufacturing firms. Uh, and, and a few years ago, we, I, I wrote an article called The Automation Divide, where we talked about, it was in Wired Magazine and elsewhere, where we focused on how the industries that are the most likely to be automated, like manufacturing, are often the most ill-equipped to handle that automation, right? So in terms of how do we use AI to augment manufacturing and how do we, in some cases, reallocate workers and so forth. And so that's what he's working on through industry labs in the next three years with his appointment. And finally, there's a couple of examples here from our human-centered analytics lab that I co-direct with Ken Kelly. So I, I, I talked about social media earlier, and I mentioned for three years, we've been focusing on how to help physicians with their remote interviews, right? So if someone zooms in, how can we use with their consent, speech to text, facial recognition and whatnot to help the physician with a dashboard that scores 
their likelihood of having different mental health conditions. And, and then the physician can work with the AI to make a decision that allows them to spend, see more patients and have more accurate outcomes. Right? So it's a kind of solving that bandwidth problem that physicians have. And frankly, a lot of patients are hesitant to come in. If you have mental health, they're much more likely to cancel their doctor's appointments. So this provides a, an alternative. And finally, we have a lot of research we've been doing on what's called Public Health 3.0. And one of the papers that just came is forthcoming in MIS Quarterly, we worked with a lot of pharmacovigilance teams as well as opioid detection teams for, again, this was a seven, eight year project that started back in 2013, 14, it's been 10 years. And basically we're trying to help detect outbreaks of opioids online through, and of course, when you do this online, it has to be privacy preserving, but also one of the things that's happened online is that the amount of credible information has gone down considerably, right? There's so much noise to the signal. And if someone is saying something like this, which is, has a lot of playing in it, I'm not going to, it's basically paraphrase it. This is a Reddit post where someone is basically saying that in their area in Ohio, there's a really strong batch of opioids coming this week, right? Now, if I, if the EMTs in that area know this, they can stock higher quantities of drugs that they need to administer when someone is ODing. Kind of morbid, I know, but that's one of the cases. How do you save lives? Another is how do you stop these dealers, of course. And so this is real-time monitoring and we're, we have hundreds of millions of data points in a graph and we're using AI to detect these really weak signals in real time and then providing the dashboard support. So it's, and we use this activity, we try to think of it as activities and you model this massive multiplex, we call it, of graphs online. So needles in a haystack with AI. And the other use case is adverse drug events more broadly. That's some examples of social good research. Every one of these projects took many years, required primary data collection, required field testing, iterating, and it's stuff that's a lot of work, but it's important, right? And it goes not using standard benchmark data sets, and focusing on positive cases for AI. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that animation. That's the title, Timely, Granular, and Actionable. I wanna make sure there's a little bit of time for questions if anyone has any, but in conclusion, the inflection point, more than ever, industry and academic research are aligned on the common task framework driven advancement of AI because it really has a significant impact on the bottom line. AI for social good, we are doing less and less of it proportionately, unfortunately, with every passing day. There are a bunch of things we could do better. We've come up with frameworks and a roadmap, but it requires not just people to commit to it, but it requires policies and other considerations, incentive alignment and so forth. And of course, at Notre Dame and elsewhere, but we're at Notre Dame, we, there is the, the golden lining we are trying to do this. And I think when we talk about AI leadership, this is going to be a big area for us and, and something we are good at doing. And even creating benchmark data sets, Notre Dame has a ton of experience creating those and, and so forth. All right. So that's the talk. Thank you. Let me begin with a question about ownership. This is a business school. Most of the people, not all, I, I know a few who aren't, most of the people are capitalists inside the building. And many of them think about the ownership of this technology. It's invented in the colleges of engineering and science, but the money seems to come from the market. People will provide the money. Warren Buffett, on this stage, not too long ago, I asked him why the dot-com bubble blew up in 2000. He paused briefly and said, more money than good ideas. He said, all the money in the market was chasing a dozen or 15 or a thousand bad ideas. So he said, our task really is not to find the money. You will always have the money. Our task is to find good ideas. The people with the money are interested in ownership and return. Do you foresee a point at which AI will become public property? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, one of the things I didn't mention when I sh earlier showed the, the three phases of the language models, remember I had the slide where it's kind of going from, they're getting bigger and, and we got to the GPT point. 
One of the things that I didn't mention, and even when you think about this sort of evolution of the parameters and the common task framework, was we talked about this perfect storm and we talked about mobile and social media and access to data and compute. Another thing though was by and large until about, I would say 2018, 2019, most state of the art models for language and vision were open source. And that changed with GPT-4, 3.54, I think is when they finally said, oh, this technology has gotten really good. And of course they piggybacked off of the common task framework, of course, as well, right? But this, hey, this is really good. So now we're not going to release it anymore. And the same thing happened with computer vision. Amazon's facial recognition algorithms uh, were not open sourced and they were relying on the technologies up, that led up to it. The trend that caused the innovation was open. Everyone owns it, part of the common task framework, and we've moved away from that. So the question is, are we going to come back to it? If, if we're monetizing AI based on intellectual property that we own, the incentives for at least organizations and big tech, which we know is a big driver of this, are not there at the moment to really release and make these things public with a few exceptions. The one exception has been Meta. So Meta has been releasing all these open source models because they are not a leader in terms of revenue. So Amazon, Google, et cetera, the ones who are leaders are not doing it. So Meta said, we are going to release it. So they've released some, some really good models. And of course, Notre Dame is part of a consortium with Meta as well that was announced a couple of months ago. But more broadly, if you think about the state of the art of what is used, right, those 100 million users, it's up to several hundred million users now, almost a billion users for GPT, which is not open source and is using our data, frankly, to get better, right? Without regulation, I don't think there's really any recourse where any incentives for that to be made public. And I think you're going to have see really good speakers about that talk about this regulation side, which is incredibly important. Uh, even at Tech Ethics Week next week, I think Kirsten Martin will talk about how we need, how the regulation for AI needs to evolve to, to get there. So I think that if we view intel intellectual property has never been made public in general in a capitalistic society. And so if we don't think of it as a public good, I don't think we're going to get there. Yeah, we tend to think in this country about common good which would include access to things like telephone service, uh, clean water, um, electricity, access to the grid. Um, increasingly, access to the internet is seen as essential rather than a luxury. Um, do you foresee access to AI for individuals as becoming part of the common good? Yeah, absolutely. If you think about even if you think about those social good use cases, we think about the UN Sustainable Development Guideline, the theme is to alleviate disparities, right? And we know now that access to high-speed internet is crucial. During COVID, there were some really interesting studies that showed people living in areas that didn't have high-speed access to internet had trouble with telework. They were more likely to get laid off. And there's some correlation versus causality to that, but it's just access to internet is essential and is aligned with our ability to earn. And so in the same way, for sure, AI is, is going to be crucial and it is crucial. We see it with education, right? Uh, think about the access to, a lot of us are familiar with YouTube. We use YouTube videos to, to learn concepts and think about the Khan Academies, which are teaching people math, not just in the U.S., but in Africa and elsewhere. And they have now language models that they allow to you to interact with to learn. So it's like a AI teacher. And so just as we would want to have public schools, right? For we think public schools are important. We think subsidized lunches are important in, 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 in many situations. Uh, in the same regard, we want to have AI access. And it's going to be interesting though, the places where that's happened, been more successful have frankly been Europe, right? Traditionally, we're in mm -hmm. Canada and so forth. But Europe and Canada are so far behind with AI that it's going to be interesting to see how that manifests in those locations. Okay. Let me remind you that if you have a question, come on down and ask it. I, I do have a follow-up for you on a case study that two of my MBAs wrote a year ago. And the question was, who owns intellectual property 
written by a robot or an algorithm. And there were two views of this. The lawyers, the intellectual property and copyright lawyers all said, are you nuts? Um, inanimate objects can't own anything that copyright and intellectual property ownership is for human beings, and that's the way it's always going to be. But some others, uh, including both engineers and philosophers, said, what about the moment AI becomes sentient and has a personality? And of course, the theologians are asking, does it have a soul? More appropriately, does it get the revenues from the sale of its own creation? Uh, the people who programmed it didn't write the program that made the money. Something clever created by the AI algorithm did that on its own. We're not there yet, but where are you on that position about ownership of intellectual property? As it relates to should the robots be allowed to own it specifically? Sure, or, uh, monthly yeah. checks, additional uh, lube jobs, whatever is uh, required. <laughs> yeah, I think, first of all, I think the, it, the, a necessary but insufficient condition for that is being sentient, right? And if you look at another area, I mean, all these virtual think tanks all across the country, folks at major at Columbia and elsewhere, where we get together and we talk about the conditions for artificial general intelligence, which is the term I would use, AGI. And whether or not you need to be sentient to have general intelligence, first of all, is a, probably a better debate to have. Because if you think about living objects, fish are generally not viewed as being sentient, right? Most, with the exception of dolphins and stuff, but you're goldfish, right? And AI, in some ways, is getting to the level of awareness and existence as something like a goldfish, perhaps. Because if you think about the rules and the stoch it's stochastic, but the way in which it behaves aligns with, say, a goldfish in that regard. So generally, there's a debate about whether sentience is needed to have artificial general intelligence. Uh, and it's a fascinating debate. But, and, and there are some really good keynotes, by the way, at NeurIPS, uh, which is one of the leading venues where people talk about this. And, and philosophers from NYU and elsewhere have come and, and said, no, we are not, we're not even close to that. So because of that, I would say we're, no, I don't think we really need to, we're at the point where we need to talk about that as a, as a concern. Um, but there's also a related thing that does come up is who owns intellectual property in a human AI augmented environment, right? Which is what happens, do I own it if I provided the prompt? And does the, the company that owns Which the language model own it if they provided the prompt? And I think that's a more interesting debate right now. So I don't think we're there in terms of sentience, and I don't think we'll be there anytime soon. All right. It doesn't have a soul. Let's move to some questions. If you could switch. One thing that I really love about Notre Dame is about, we always talk about good. And thank you so much for letting me know that iPhone come out at 06 and 07, because I'm too young to know. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my question. So you have mentioned that a lot of the tech advancement recently are driven by the big tech firm for social good. We have been talking about this for many years, for example, ESG, right? But interestingly, in recent years, I think I read an article from uh, Wall Street Journal last month talking about most of the earning calls now just drop the term of ESG at all. They don't talk about ESG anymore. So how do you see how, what's the next step for ESG or how this big company can help us to advance for social good, et cetera, and et cetera? Because it seems like the trend just tip up a little bit, then it drops down already. Yeah, I think it's all driven by what shareholder value, right? And so we know if you look at the literature in ESG and things, it's going to, the focus is always on either the subset of things that align with reducing operating expenditures and so forth, like hotels saying, hey, we're not going to wash your towels every day, right? That's just go in. Or things where if they claim to be doing some things and shareholders feel like they aren't actually uh, you know, doing it in good faith and there's some boycotting happening. And so we don't quite see that here, right? So just as we talk about the privacy paradox of, uh, there, there is a social good paradox. We are all part of this behavioral modification engine machine, right? When I showed those technologies that have a lot of adoption, the TikToks and YouTubes, right? The model is to maximize engagement, right? Not just get the users, but keep them engaged. If you look at engagement, ChatGPT is not nearly close to TikTok and YouTube and Spotify in terms of that, right? So it's about, I, once, until that alignment happens, I don't, I'm personally skeptical of it's, there's just, 
where we are seeing it is on a little bit on privacy and the more general AI governance, the for-profit use cases, how do we ensure we have guardrails on those? But that's, with the exception of tech ethics, most of that wouldn't fall under social good, right? Yes. So that's where we are seeing the tech ethics one, we're going to see progress because that's aligned with sort of the financial model and there's incentives and regulation that's going to make that more aligned. All right. Yep. I think we have time for two more. Let me give you the first of those and we'll conclude with you, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I noticed on one of your slides, it detected depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, things like that, PTSD. I'm working on uh, AI uh, app that will help with violence in South Bend. That was my McCloskey entry. I made the deadline by Tuesday, by the way. So the app, the idea is we've had, we're now, South Bend is now the most violent city in Indiana. There's a shooting death every other week in South Bend. So my AI enabled app is first to connect people to resources they need, 1600 nonprofits. The second part, is to have AI enabled therapy chatbots because 24 seven, the young generation that's doing the violence mostly has that phone in their hand. <laughs> There's things like Wobot and things like that. I was wondering in your research labs, are you, and this is like trying to tie it into what I'm doing. Is there anything to detect someone who's about to be violent? Cause I'd like to incorporate that with my McCloskey project. <laughs> Yeah, no, unfortunately, we haven't done any research where you're trying to predict if someone's going to be violent. That reminds me of some of the movie references I do use, though, in, in class, like Minority Report and things where you're right. <laughs> trying to predict the crime before it might happen. There is, and we've done a lot of work in crime analytics, but it's more about integrating data sources. So more like what you said with the nonprofits, trying to be more aware, situationally aware of what's happening and coordinating the activities they have. There is also a lot of work, of course, as you said, on chatbots for mental health related that they can interact with individuals. But we have not seen much research yet on, on that prediction. And one thing I didn't talk about in my talk too much, I know others are going to focus on it in this series, is there is also this sort of what happens with the false positives when you predict these outcomes. And so even with the healthcare professionals, with the detection, we try to provide the evidence to the psychiatrist and the models are not always correct, right? And, and so with same thing with, with this sort of violence uh, prediction. We don't, we, so we haven't done that work yet. So they discovered <laughs> that AI actually has um, better answers and is um, more empathetic with the ambient um, AI. Oh. So I thought that was interesting. But if you don't mind, I'd like to speak to you af afterwards about my McCloskey project. Of course, I'd love to chat afterwards. Thank you so much for what you're doing. That was Thank you. So let's go to our final question, you, sir. All right. Thank you for this presentation. I really did enjoy the conversation. I also enjoy the conversation around everything that we've talked about last time as well. So my question is just gathering your opinion on, as we look at business growth and seeing how data and AI is being able to give us predictive analytics and predicting things before we might even think about it and provides an incredible amount of convenience. But at the same time, people have a incredible fear of surveillance in the sense, and we have this dual sense of, I really want security and want the officiators to know about everything that's going on, but we also can't have full privacy at the same time. So my question is for you is, do you envision a, a way that we can both have AI to help us in the way of convenience and advancing things that we might want and need before we even think about it, but also doing that in an ethical way? That's an excellent question. Uh, and yes, I think short answer is if you think about the principles of innovation and the principles of precaution, it's essential that they go hand in hand. And if you think traditionally, the way technological innovations and, and science and progress happens is we have the innovation and then we think about as it's, as we know, it's moved from the art of the possible to the art of the practical and valuable. We suddenly think about the guardrails and how do we ensure there's no unintended consequences, right? That's normally the, been the paradigm for decades. And that's how innovation curves. And in my classes, I show that for various technologies, the, the, the things that are the innovation aspects of it are 10 years ahead. And then you see the, 
privacy and, and, and in this case, the responsible AI stuff, right? The, what's changed with AI is that because the pace of change is so fast, the innovation is moving at light speed. I just gave you an example with language models and within a couple of years, it just took off GPT. What I didn't show was it's, it wouldn't be good enough to get, it wouldn't be good enough in terms of GMAT scores for our MBA program with 3.5, but GPT-4 would be, right? It's top of there. And so now the challenge we're facing though is really the speed needed for the principle of precaution. And we have this other whole series and I might talk about it. I think I'm doing Tech Ethics Week on Monday, actually. The timing is interesting, but uh, this idea of by design. There's a GDPR in Europe, they talk about privacy by design. And there's this need for thinking about responsible AI by design. So the only way we can balance the principles of precaution and innovation are if we are innovate, when we're innovating, we are thinking about the responsible AI framework of privacy, fairness, interpretability, et cetera, but we're not there yet. And so it's, it's definitely cause for concern. The students, faculty, staff, and leadership of the Mendoza College of Business, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your time. Thank you for being here. We'll catch you at the next of these lectures.